We've got multiple things to watch, live sports, in the next two days. How awesome is that? I haven't worn this hat in feels like four years. It actually probably has been that long because I found it in the closet a couple days ago. So it might have actually been four years. But the point is, is that baseball is back tomorrow and I wasn't sure that was actually going to happen. And we got live NBA scrimmages today, tomorrow, the next day, as we prepare for the beginning of the NBA season a week from tomorrow. Aren't you excited? I'm ex I'm so excited that at 11:40 we're going to predict who wins the scrimmages that the NBA is putting on NBA TV in the next few days. I recognize that that's just kind of dumb, believe me, but I'm doing it anyways. Welcome to the J Mole show. 110sportsmedia.com slash live, twitch.tv slash the Jamel show. Thank you so much for making us a part of your day today on a Wednesday. It's hump day. We're almost there. We've got baseball tomorrow, and then things just things just get a little bit easier. So as a result, tomorrow, baseball coming back. So uh, here in about two or three minutes, we're going to start uh, looking at division champs predictions. In Major League Baseball, I'll run through those real quick here in the first segment of the show. Segment two, impact players at the top of the Eastern Conference. Because we've been doing that for the last couple weeks and we've got the, the top four teams in the Eastern Conference to cover uh, to finish out that collection of conversations. Then we've got some other NBA news. Like, like I said, we'll do some scrimmage predicting there. But we'll also talk about Dwight Howard, some players that are leaving the bubble uh, some really good news uh, on the coronavirus cases side of things. Uh, and then we'll get out of here with FYI and call it a day. Uh, but like I said, I want to start on the baseball side of things because baseball is coming back tomorrow. And that just makes me very happy. Very happy. Hope it makes you guys happy. Because here's the thing. I read a story the other day and and I've certainly talked on this show quite a bit about sports not maybe making the most sense and I still ultimately sit there to a certain extent that when you look at the facts now compared to when things were suspended that restarting them doesn't make a whole lot of sense but here's the thing that here's the conclusion that I've come to is that even if it doesn't make sense, embrace it. Just enjoy it. You know, enjoy the fact that if that for the next, you know, on July 30th and the next, you know, week and a half, two weeks after that, you're going to have basketball starting at noon and going through the rest of the day. That's awesome. That's going to feel like NCAA tournament stuff. And I don't know about you guys, but the NCAA tournament, the first and second rounds of the NCAA tournament are, you know, my second and third, third and fourth favorite days of the entire sports year. So just embrace it. Get Let yourself get excited about something. If for no other reason other than I really wish I had something to be excited about. You know, there's not a whole lot of that nowadays. And tomorrow, we have a reason to be excited. A week from tomorrow, we have a reason to be excited. Today, we have a reason to be excited on the sports side of things. And even if it is ultimately not important in the grand scheme of things, keep the perspective of how it's not that big of a deal, but embrace it. Enjoy it. Just because you have a reason to enjoy something and have a reason to get excited about something that's been absent from the country for the last four months or so from a major sports perspective. So embrace it. Enjoy it. And uh, and get excited about it just because it's, it's fun to get excited about things and there hasn't been a whole lot of reasons to get excited in the last several months. But let's run through it. We got six divisions. 
AL East, AL Central, AL West, and the other side of the league in the NL, for those of you who don't know how this works. But let's hop right into it. We'll start in the AL, and we'll start in the AL East. You know, I think here it's it's pretty clearly the Yankees. If Assuming they can stay healthy, which is clearly a major if, and it has been the last several seasons. I mean, they the last two years or so, they've put two, three years, have put one of the best rosters on the field in the entire league. But they just can't keep that roster on the field for injuries that have plagued them for the last couple of years. But listen, they, they've got... They added one of, if not the best pitcher in baseball in Garrett Cole. And then, at least for right now, you've got an even longer stretch of time for these players to get healthy because now it's been, shoot, nine months since they played baseball. It's been a long time to get your body right. And if there's a if there's a season that... If, there, if there's a perfect situation for a Yankees team... You know, just to be com- as completely healthy as possible, it's probably this. Um, now, you can make an argument that injuries make a bigger impact on a 60 game season. That's certainly valid. But at the same time, it's 102 less games in the regular season. And that also is important on the back, uh, you know, on the heels of a nine game, uh, of a nine month off season. You know, if they can't stay healthy, the next most interesting team is the Rays with uh, a really strong rotation and just kind of an exciting and creative team that, uh, you know, it's certainly not out of the realm of possibility that they win the division, especially if the Yankees have a couple of key injuries. But I think you'd be silly at this point to, with the offseason that the Yankees got, to bet against them in the 60 game season you know boston go Sox. um uh, without mookie bets the 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 margin of error the margin of one guy on the offensive side of things slacking a little bit the margin is much smaller without mookie bets there and but the the offense will ultimately be fine i think but the rotation is just terrifyingly uninspiring and you don't have Chris sale. And there's just a lot of question marks there. And a lot of guys who are okay pitchers, solid pitchers, but they're much more solid when they can be at the back end of the rotation. And you've got guys that you can really count on at the front and Boston just doesn't have that this year. So in the AL East, I'll go with the Yankees in the central AL central. I think it's, pretty clearly the twins you know historically great off uh, offense last season 307 home runs i think as a team last year and then they added josh donaldson so they're not going to be i mean they're not going to have a historically great year like that again it's probably not going to happen but they don't have to with one of the best top to bottom lineups in baseball ninth best ERA from the pitching staff last season their pitching staff also got better so uh, in terms of places that the twins could have really improved to help them maybe get over the hump the pitching staff was was that place and they got a little better bit better there as well you know for the first time in forever it's there's reasons to be excited about the White Sox which is the other interesting team here I think the you know them not being the favorite to win the AL Central is is not necessarily as much a commentary on how good they aren't as opposed to how good the Twins are and the lineup that they're putting together. But you have Tim Tim Anderson, some of the best prospects in baseball in the outfield, and then the pitching of Lucas Giolito, who is who had a really great season last year and if he can keep that that up then the White Sox are going to have a good season. It's it's really quite amusing to see, you know, I think ultimately right now there's more reason to be excited about the White Sox than there is to be about the Cubs. And maybe it's just because the Cubs have been, you know, solid for the last handful of years now and the White Sox are sort of up and coming. Once again after I think it's an 11-year playoff drought. So that's a little weird that in Chicago the team that 
is just sort of getting more attention and the team that people are talking about is the White Sox as opposed to the Cubs, which have dominated Chicago baseball, relatively speaking, for for the last handful of years. But I think regardless of what the White Sox do, I think the Twins are just the team to beat, certainly, and certainly have the best roster in that. Uh, certainly have the best ro- roster in that division, in my opinion. And the West, I'll go with the Astros. You know, I, I there might not be a team in the entire world that benefits from the fact that there won't be fans in the stadium than the Astros, just because when they go to no, they might still get thrown at. I, I would expect them to still get thrown at, but it's been three more months than it would have been. It's sort of become a headline of the past, both the the rage of players across the league as well as the rage of fans and what the booing was going to be. Now, I'm sure when we get to opening day in 2021, I'm sure that they will get booed. I'm sure they will because fans will jump on that uh, that opportunity. But in terms of letting people cool off, there's probably not a team that benefits more from there not being fans in the stands when they go on the road than the Astros because otherwise it would just be boos for hours and hours and hours and days and days and days across the entire season. With that being said, the Astros, I still think are the best team in this division. It's a little more interesting. I think the A's are still a little, they're close, but they're still not quite there. The angels are interesting. You mean, you finally got a guy to protect Mike Trout in that lineup with Rendon, uh, Otani, coming back after you know we'll be back on the mound this season as well as as at the plate so the the Astros are certain excuse me the Angels are certainly interesting this year and the A's continue to I think get a little bit closer every year the thing with the A's though is that they're just notorious for the slow start and having a really great second half it's just a lot harder to to gain ground in a season that's only 60 game, 60 games as opposed to 162. But it, it's an interesting division um, for multiple reasons. And but if the Astros, you know, their their offense isn't going to be a problem and if their rotation without Garrett Cole can you know even in their mid 30s be a team, uh, be a rotation that is solid and consistent, then then they'll be just fine. In this uh, in the NL East you know, this is one of the, in my opinion, the closer races between the Braves and the Nats. Atlanta certainly has the youth and the upside, but the Nationals anchored by a rotation of Scherzer, Strasburg, and Patrick Corbin. I mean, that's a pretty impressive top three in, in a rotation. And, you know, the fewer the games, the more a deeper rotation matters because your your star is going to get to pitch less games just obviously so the more games that you can get out of a rotation that you feel comfortable it's really solid about a guy going to the mound on every occasion the better but with that being said i'm going to go with the braves just because i mean they won this division last year and then got blown out in game five of the NLDS against the Cardinals. Like that's a t- really, really tough pill to swallow. And then it's just hard to get motivated after winning a title. And it's even harder to get motivated when it's been so long and it's a 60 game season. And it's a kind of weird and the nationals were not anywhere near the best team in baseball last year. So it's not like, it's not like this is a dominant team coming back for another year. It was a team who got hot at the right time and had some timely pitching and, and, and timely hitting. And that's, you know, that's not giving quite as much credit as they probably deserve. But the point is still the same that it's, it, it isn't the scariest roster in, even in their division, much less in baseball. So I'll go with the Braves, give them the slight edge, but it, it will be close in the NL East. In the NL Central, it's, it's the Reds and that's weird. Like, it's weird. You know, it's probably the most wide-open division in baseball this season. It's still really funny to just talk about the Reds being good. It's a pretty, like I said, a pretty wide-open division, but I think the Reds are at least going into the season, especially with the rotation of Sonny Gray, Luis Castillo, and Trevor Bauer. I'll go with them in the 60-game season, and uh, 
wait for somebody else to make a move and prove me wrong. But I think that's that one's pretty simple. Um, but with that being said, there that that division could be could be won by anybody. In the West, out in the NL, it's the Dodgers, and it's not even close. I mean, there's enormous pressure on them to win a World Series, without a doubt. There's there's major pressure on them to win a World Series. But winning the division is something they've done. They've done before. The Diamondbacks and the Padres are both solid baseball teams, but I'm not sure either of them are ready to compete with the Dodgers for this division. In fact, I know that neither of them are ready for the, to compete with the Dodgers for this division. I mean, we're talking about a lineup with Mookie Betts, Justin Turner, Cody Bellinger, Corey Seager, and then you're anchored by one of the best pitchers in baseball over the last 10 years in Clayton Kershaw. It's it's really the Dodgers in the it, like it, it's been a while since I felt like there were two teams in each division that were so far ahead of everybody else and so clearly the favorites and the Dodgers and in, in the NL and the Yankees and the AL. So that's where the pressure is for those two teams and and for the Dodgers in particular they've done they've done the win the division thing before but they keep being a really good team and keep falling short um in the fall classic losing that um losing that series twice in the last three years in the world series but that that's where the pressure is but it's in terms of division i don't think it's it's all that close and before we before we go to break let's talk predictions for tomorrow night so you got the yankees and nationals um and then the dodgers and giants give me garrett cole in the yankees lineup that is healthy even if it's just for one game i mean I'm like expecting everybody to get hurt. Um, but give me that. Give me the Yankees on opening night. And then Dodgers and Giants. You know, Kershaw has lost once on opening day in the last, since 2011. He's got five wins and two no decisions. He's never given up more than 300 runs and has pitched at least six innings in all but one. Add that on to the fact that the Dodgers have one of the scariest lineups in baseball, and I'll take them every day of the week uh, in that opening day game. But, uh, but those are my division predictions. The Yankees in the AL East, Twins in the Central, Astros in the West on the AL side of things, on the NL side of things, Braves in the East, Reds in the Central, and the Dodgers in the West. Uh, coming up next, we'll talk about the impact players at the top of the Eastern Conference, round up that series that we've been doing for the last couple for the last week and a half or so uh, and then we'll get to more uh, basketball news as we get deeper in the show you're watching the jamal show on 110 sportsmedia.com
We're back on the JML Show on a Wednesday. Thank you so much for making us a part of your day today. Just ran through the divisions uh, on the Major League Baseball side of things, making predictions as the season gets underway tomorrow. I'm pumped. But let's move back over to the bread and butter, the NBA. We've been doing this series for the last uh, week and a half or so on the show. Uh, basically talking impact players on each team. So we're trying not to talk about Giannis, not to talk about LeBron, not to talk about Kawhi. The best player on every team, we're trying not to talk about that guy because, of course, if that guy doesn't play well, then these teams don't have a chance. That's just how this works. If LeBron and AD don't play well, then it doesn't matter what anybody else on the team does. So that's the idea. That's the spirit behind this. Let's hop into it. We got four teams, the Bucks, Raptors, Celtics, and the Heat. We'll start with the Heat. We'll just go uh, at four and work our way backwards to, to number one. You know, in Miami, I think it's pretty clearly Bam Adebayo. You know, of course, Jimmy Butler is going to be that guy in crunch time. There are still questions about, in my opinion, if he can be the guy on a team that contends for a title. He still hasn't done that. I mean, he was great in Philly and was certainly a guy who was willing to take over games in the playoffs last season. But the Bulls teams were never all that good. Is this team good enough? There's a bunch of really young guys and then Jimmy Butler on this team, basically. And guys that are really going to be a lot better three years from now. You know, your Tyler Heroes, your Bam Adebayos, your Kendrick Nuns of the world. And Jimmy Butler, at the age of 30, is like, let's win now. Like, the every year, my clock is ticking. I'm getting to the point where I'm not getting better every season. I'm just sort of, you know, plateauing out. And then, you know, on that gradual decrease, it declines. So he's trying to win now. And there's a lot of players on that team can, who can just benefit from really nice playoff experience and continue to get better as as the years go by. In the next three or four years, the Heat, if their roster is relatively similar, then this is a team that I think is, is really competing in the East. But like I said, Bam is the guy here, you know, Partly because on the offensive end, like he's been really great. And apart from Jimmy Butler, he's been the next guy on this team. But on the defensive side of things, he's the guy who's going to be guarding Giannis. He's the guy who's probably going to be guarding Joel Embiid. He's the guy who's going to be guarding Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown. Their defensive presence begins with Bam Adebayo. Now, they've got a really solid defense, especially, you know, you, they added Andre Iguodala, who's, of course, you know, we know what Iguodala is in. We know what he is as a defender, especially in the playoffs. You've got Jay Crowder, Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo. Like, they've got the guys to really bother a, a star, but Bam is the best defender on this team. I mean, we're talking about 10 rebounds, 16 points, block and a half per game. He's he's easily the the highest, uh, easily the the guy with the most blocks on this team this season. So the the defense for Miami starts with Adebayo and how he plays against the best players that he's guarding on the other team is is going to directly impact how far the Heat can go in the playoffs. And and there's just the other added pressure of this is this is the first time. Like, Bam is one of the two best players on the fourth best team in the East and a team that can you can reasonably suggest can, can make a push. Um, now, they're not going to make it super far, but there's – there's at least a world where they really make the Bucks work in the 1-4 in the second round, especially if Bam plays really well against Giannis and they have a good shooting series and maybe the Bucks, who aren't nearly as good to the three-point shooting team as you might think with their margin of victory this season. There's, there's certainly a world where they can be very annoying for for the heat i mean for the bucks so i'm going with bam uh in miami in 
Boston, I think, you know, it's a little bit of a cop-out because Kemba is really a very talented player. But it, there's just a couple talking points I want to touch on here. The first just being that I'm so intrigued to see how the Celtics team changes as a playoff team with a guy that is likable and a point guard that the Celtics trust in a way that they just didn't trust Kyrie. And you hear you hear everybody talk about how the vibe in that locker room is just different than it was when, when Kyrie was there. And that just, I mean, that matters. And I know it doesn't, like, liking the guys in your locker room certainly doesn't turn into championships. That's, that's it's like, you know, passion doesn't always turn into success, but it certainly doesn't hurt. And liking your guys really doesn't hurt and, and really helps uh, in the NBA. And I think that's just what you got. And, and then the other side of things is, you know, of course, he's, he's struggling with his knee still. He's had multiple surgeries on the knee that he said he was – that was still bothering him when he had media availability. Uh, it's been about a week ago now. But so there's that added pressure there, but also just the fact that Kemba has not had the luxury of being on good basketball teams for his entire career. I mean, he's been in Charlotte. They've only made the playoffs twice, I believe, and they got bounced in the first round both times. So it, it's not very often that you see a guy of the caliber of Kemba Walker who is as highly thought of as he is, who's had a, as good of career as he has, who's had as little playoff experience as he does. And so this is just a new step for Kimba to play on a really good basketball team in the playoffs, a team that's, I mean, if you ask me to rank the teams that I thought, you know, rank and order the teams that I would bet on to make the NBA finals out of the Eastern Conference, it would be the Bucks first and the Celtics second. Uh, despite them being the thir the three seed, so I think that's th that's at least something that Kimba. It's a position that Kimba's never been in, and of course, if he's not healthy, that really that really hurts the Celtics. But it's very intriguing what he maybe could be in Boston, what he's like on a really good team, uh, especially surrounded by guys who, who take some of that pressure off him as well. I mean, in Charlotte, everyone knew who the best player was and who the scorer was and who they were going to in crunch time. I'm not sure Kemba's any of those things on his team. He's not the best player. He's pretty close. He's certainly the most proven from a longevity perspective, but Jason Tatum's the the superstar potential on this team. And if he plays the way that he did prior to the suspension of the season, then, then he absolutely is a superstar. It's going to be Tatum and crunch time. You would think. And you know, that Tatum is and then you've got Hayward, you got Jalen Brown, Marcus smart. They're just guys to take the pressure off of Kimbo, which is also something he's never experienced before because they, he wasn't exactly getting a lot of help in in Charlotte for the Raptors I think it's OG Ananobi for a similar reason to to Bam Adebayo now Bam certainly has a offensive responsibility that Ananobi doesn't but Ananobi is the replacement for Kawhi in the in terms of who's guarding the best player on the other team I mean, Ananobi is an elite defender and certainly has the ability to be a guy that you feel really good about guarding the other team's best player, but it's just something he's going to have to prove and, and something that he wasn't last year. And he sort of loses his, his place on this team. He played really well two years ago. and then, But, you know, when you have Kawhi, of course, OG Ananobi is not Kawhi. But he's going to be the guy guarding the best player on the other team. He's only 22. He's playing 30 minutes a game, you know, at scoring 11 points and pulling down five and a half rebounds. So certainly a player that has other skills, but his biggest job will be to guard the best player on the other team, especially when you're trying to take as much pressure off Siakam on the defensive end as you can, because Siakam is the best player on this team and 
the guy who is going to have the majority of the offensive responsibility from a scoring points perspective, along with Kyle Lowry. You know, Fred Van Vliet has turned into a 17.6 points and 6.6 re- assists per game, along with four rebounds guy, which is just ridiculous. And shouts to, to Fred for turning into that kind of player. And then you've got, you know, you've got three other guys in Lowry, Norman Powell, and Serge Ibaka who are all averaging at least 16 points a game. So it's not like Anobi is going to have a lot of pressure to score, but all of those guys you'd rather not have to put on the best perimeter guy on the on the other team, and that's where that's where Anobi really makes a big impact on this team. And then of course you've got you know you've got Terrence Davis, Marcus All, Rondé Hollis Jefferson, Chris Boucher. Like there are a lot of guys on this team who are just they got a lot of guys, and and when you look at this roster, it makes perfect sense that the raptors are as good as they are this season but uh ananobi is is certainly the guy who i think is that is that impact player for the raptors and then finally in milwaukee it's a bit of a cop out just because chris middleton is easily the second best player on this team but in my opinion chris middleton is is the guy that is the second superstar is the second star on a team that opens up the game for their best player more than any other player in the NBA because for a couple reasons. One, if Middleton doesn't score well, the Bucks aren't going to the finals and that's it's that simple. You have Giannis at 29 points per game and then Middleton at 21, but then you've only got Bledsoe and Lopez are the only other two guys on this team averaging double figures this season and Say what you want about Eric Bledsoe. He's been pretty bad in the playoffs his entire career, and certainly in the seasons where he's being asked to be a starting point guard. The Bucks are not a great three-point shooting team. You know, George Hill is shooting 48%, but he's only taking 2.9 threes per game. Middleton's the three-point threat on this team and it makes it really easy for the Bucks to be guarded if he's not shooting well. You just meet Giannis at the free throw, and I don't care what, I mean, the video that came out of Giannis making five threes in a row, like, oh my, whoa. I've made five threes in a row before. Wide open, taking one dribble. I'm 5'9", and his release was so slow that I could block him, him standing at 6'11". Now that might not actually be true, but the point is, is that Giannis is not a three-point shooter, and just because he knocked down a couple threes with nobody guarding him in practice doesn't mean he's coming to the bubble with a new with a new dynamite skill from beyond the three-point line. Because if he does, then the with that being said, if he has, and I'm just wrong, then it's just all over for everybody. Because then he's impossible to guard. But I don't think that's the case. And if Middleton is not shooting well, then it gets even tougher for Giannis to get in the lane and even tougher and, and even easier for guy, people to, to sag off of Giannis and make him shoot six threes a game, seven threes a game, and make him beat them from, from the outside, which is really the way you guard him in the playoffs. And you saw him neutralized a little bit last season in the Eastern Conference playoffs because teams figured that out and then it gets a much more difficult for Giannis to score. So those are the impact players in the Eastern card, the Bucks, Chris Middleton, you got Ananobi in Toronto, Kemba in Boston and Bam Adebayo in Miami. I'm really excited for the NBA to come back. Uh, it's certainly the one I have the most interest in. And certainly the one uh, I've been waiting the longest to come back, especially when you just we were so close to the to the finals uh, to the playoffs and and a really interesting end to this season. We had to wait for so long, but we've got it back. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk even more NBA news. We've got some players leaving the bubble. Dwight Howard saying some silly things, and then we'll for fun predict some scrimmages that are happening over the next couple of days in the NBA, but uh, we'll do that next. You're watching the JML Show on 110sportsmedia.com.
Welcome back to the Jamal Show on a Wednesday. Thank you so much for making us a part of your day. 110sportsmedia.com slash live, twitch.tv slash the Jamal Show. Got some new content up on the site today. We got 2014 NBA draft regrades, the continuation of uh, all decade at each position in Major League Baseball. Uh, NFL draft regrades. Josh Doring actually has a, a column up about giving college coaches the benefit of the doubt or or more specifically not giving them the benefit of the doubt anymore. It's a good column if you haven't checked it out yet. Uh, you should. You should. It's a good one. But uh, lots of content going on over there. You know, we, we, we just talked impact players at the top of the East. And now I want to talk just about some of the news. Just get you caught up on, on what's happening in the NBA bubble uh, in the last few days. You know, some of this is, is slightly older news. Some of it uh, relatively new. But you know, first, you've got zero positive cases uh, on Monday. Uh, it was the first uh, coronavirus report since... The 13th of July, I believe, and Monday would have been the 20th. Uh, Shams from the Athletic reporting that they that there were zero new cases in the bubble. So, so in theory, right? You've gotten to zero cases. So at this point, it should be pretty easy to keep things under wraps. I mean, we'll get to the players that that had to leave the bubble here in a second, but. You're officially to the point where it should be relatively easy to at least keep it to the point where COVID-19 isn't going to be the reason. COVID-19 inside the bubble isn't going to be the reason that the NBA season doesn't happen. Because I think now everybody's there. You know, the next the next big one is when teams can have their families come when there's only eight uh, teams left in the playoffs. That's that's going to be the next step, and of course there are the things that, uh, the other things like the Walt Disney World members that aren't being tested nearly as often, and maybe they bring something in, even though they're not having a lot of direct impact with the players. There's certainly a possibility that that could happen. But this is really good news for the NBA, of obviously just you know from a player health perspective, but also from a, um from an optics perspective and and if this season is actually going to happen this is about as good as you can ask for before the season starts you have a day where you have zero positive cases and that's that's really important and really impactful and uh in in sort of the the scope of the rest of this nba season you've got a couple players having to leave the bubble zion and first of all the most important thing here is is hopefully that zion is whatever is going on with his family, whatever family urgent family matter, matter he had to attend to, you know, it worries me a little bit that they didn't say what, because usually if it's not that big of a deal, they, I mean, J.J. Redick, no, excuse me, not J.J. Redick, Gordon Hayward, had say, you know, I'm going to leave the bubble if my wife is pregnant, uh, Mike Conley's wife also pregnant. So the the point being that if it's something that's, of not terrible nature usually it, some details come out about it and we've heard nothing about what zion had to leave for so hopefully first and foremost his family is okay whatever he has to attend to is is okay and he can get back to he can get back to the bubble in a time soon enough that he can do the quarantine period and still get back with the pelicans before uh before the season is over and before the games don't matter because of course you know if the pelicans get off to a slow start they could be pretty much out before the season before he even gets back and that's that's really tough and the other one is is patrick beverly who also had to leave the bubble for a personal matter i don't know much about that one either but you know and my uh my esteemed colleague josh doring has you know he's talked about how the players not playing are going to impact the legacy of this season because it's it's going to take quite a bit for clear clearly from a from just a facts perspective from a very, and on a very basic level this season should be seen as 
a full NBA season. And whoever wins this title should be seen as a team that is uh, on of the same pedigree as a team that would have won a title in a reg- in a normal season. Because you played basically the entire regular season, and you're going to have to play the entire playoffs in the same manner, just doing it on a neutral court. But what can skew the way that this finals, this playoffs, this season is looked at is if there are a bunch of really important players that didn't play. If Zion wasn't there with the Pelicans, if Beverly, which is you know certainly not the best player on that Clippers team, but a tone setter and a phenomenal defender you've got him uh, leaving the bubble for an emergency personal matter but Montres Harrell also leaving the bubble with a family emergency I mean the Clippers are not a full team right now and that's where you can really get into this conversation of okay but what about the Clippers who didn't have all of their players that's where this gets this gets tricky and you've seen this gets tricky for players coming back and the possibility of them bringing COVID-19 back into the bubble um, and of course them just not being away changes this the scale and the scope of what happens uh, in the NBA for the remainder of the season we're gonna have to talk about Dwight Howard a little bit who's making just comments that make him seem really silly about him not understanding the reason him not understanding why masks need to be worn and look at the war yeah the Warriors last season I mean that's that Raptors I mean because it's Kawhi and Kawhi played so incredibly like I think ultimately that Raptors championship won't be looked at with the asterisk next to it that they didn't play a, a fully healthy Warriors team but it's certainly it's a great point is that you know, it, you can't help but ask yourself what would have happened if the Warriors would have been healthy because the answer is probably the Warriors would have won another finals. But that's not the case. Durant gets hurt, ter- uh, you know, you know, really gets hurt. Clay tears his ACL, and then it's basically Steph and Draymond, and that's not a team good enough to beat a Kawhi, the, the Kawhi Raptors. But, you know, the, the biggest thing about, with Dwight Howard here is – is not necessarily what he said, but but now he's a distraction for the Lakers, which is something he had been. I mean, the the narrative on Dwight Howard all season was, you know, this guy is making a, a a significant impact at a point in his career when I think most people had sort of written him off as just a guy who was going to bounce around teams until he retired. He's making a significant impact on a team that has aspirations of winning a championship. And that's what he had been all season. And now you get to this point where he's a distraction where and this is I, I read this in an athletic article and won't take won't take credit for this, th- this idea, but he almost did it. And now it's sort of now the narrative Dw- around Dwight Howard right now is a guy who doesn't understand why you should probably you, why you should wear a mask. And that's not that's not a good look for the NBA, for the Lakers, or for Dwight Howard. But it's just, it was tough to listen to what what Dwight Howard had to say. All right, let's do it. The most unnecessary predictions segment of all time. We've got inner squad scrimmages that are going to be televised on NBA TV. We're starting with the doubleheader today, Wednesday, July 22nd. 2 p.m. Eastern, 2, 3 p.m. Eastern. We're literally three hours away from two NBA teams playing each other on TV. And so, of course, we're going to predict it. We got the Magic against the Clippers. Give me the Clippers. Um, even without their, their guys there, give me the Clippers in that one. Uh, New Orleans and Brooklyn. The Brooklyn, are, or Brooklyn Nets are... Barely a basketball team at this point. Give me the Pelicans with, you know, you got Drew Holiday, uh, Lonzo Ball, J.J. Redick. Give me those guys. Brandon Negram. Give me that team uh, ahead of, uh, uh, over Brooklyn because Brooklyn's barely a basketball team at this point. Zach's going with the Magic. All right, I respect that. On Thursday, July 23rd, so tomorrow, 
Uh, Trailblazers against the Pacers. Give me the Blazers. I'm assuming that Oladipo won't play in that. That's that's going to be weird, right? Like Oladipo still hasn't officially committed to playing the season, even though he's there and has been playing five on five. But would it would be weird if he scrimmaged and people would just keep asking questions. Either way, I'll take the Blazers with Skinny Mello, uh, Yusuf Nurkic, who I think was one of the underrated impact players in who, who's coming back that wasn't a part of that Blazers team earlier this season due to injuries. So I'll go with the Blazers. Lakers, Mavs, interesting. This is going to be interesting because, you know, the Mavs are good, man. The Mavs are good. But, and, and it's one of those things, I mean, this is silly because you, you don't know how much. I'll go with the Mavs just because I don't think LeBron and AD are going to play all that much. Um Give me, give me the Mavs in that one, and the Lakers just have a horrible backcourt, and we've talked about that on the show already in the last you know week and a half. July twenty sixth, a Sunday quadruple header. Sixers Thunder. It's a that's a good one. I'll go with the Thunder. I'll go with the Thunder. It's gonna be interesting though. That'll be their first sort of look at what uh, Ben Simmons in that power forward position actually looks like but give me the give me the thunder uh, i really like that thunder team and and find them to be uh quite scary in my opinion uh did i miss one i might have missed one um well a, a clear apparently i missed one we're, we're uh, kings versus heat give me the heat all day uh give me the heat easily uh in that one um Pacers and Mavericks. Give me the Mavericks. Trailblazers, Raptors. Mm. Give me the Blazers again. Rockets, Grizzlies. Um, give me the Grizzlies without without Westbrook uh, having gotten to gotten to camp yet. And Spurs, Pacers, give me the Pacers in that one. I don't have all that much confidence in the Spurs, uh, especially without Marcus Aldridge. Let me see if I missed any. I, I think apparently they've got some scrimmages on here. July 22nd, give, get that out of here. Uh, okay, so we talked about the Clippers magic. Wizards, Nuggets, give me the Nuggets. The Wizards are a, a shell of themselves. Uh Give me the Heat on Thursday. Spurs, Bucks. Give me the Bucks. Um, Jazz, Suns tomorrow night as well. Give me the Jazz easy. Uh, Friday, Grizzly Sixers. That's an interesting one. Suns, quit that. Um, Grizzly Sixers. That's an interesting one actually. Um, I'll, I'll go with the Sixers in that one. You know, the Grizzlies just found out that they're not going to be with with Justice Winslow, which is a pretty big hit for them. July, uh, 5 p.m. on July 24th, Thunder Celtics. Give me the Celtics. That's an interesting one. I'll definitely be watching that one. Rockets Raptors uh, on Friday night. Give me the Raptors. Um, so many games. Uh, Lakers Magic. Give me the Lakers. Bucks Kings. Give me the Bucks. Heat Jazz, give me the Heat. Nets Spurs, give me the Spurs. Clippers Wizards, give me the Clippers. Nuggets Pelicans, give me the Nuggets. And then on July 26th, man, we got a bunch of scrimmages here that we haven't gotten to yet. July 26th, Sixers Thunder, give me the Sixers. Maybe I said Thunder. Uh, Sun Celtics, give me the Celtics. Pacers, Mavs, give me the Mavs. We touched on the other two already. Wizards, Lakers, give me the Lakers. Kings, Clippers, give me the Clips. Jazz, Nets, give me the Jazz. Magic, Nuggets, give me the Nuggets. Pelicans, Bucks, that one's interesting, but give me the Bucks. And then on Tuesday, Grizzlies, Heat, give me the Grizzlies, just spite Zach. Uh, Raptors, Suns, give me the Raptors. Spurs, Pacers, give me the Pacers. Thunder, Blazers, give me the Blazers. Celtics, Rockets, give me the Celtics. And then Mavs, Sixers, eh, give me the Sixers. And then we'll get the the beginning of the season on uh, July 30th. We're not going to take a break. We're just going to jump right into FYI to, get, uh, to, to wrap up the show here. FYI number one, the Columbus Crew won yet again. 
dominating Group E. Absolute destruction. 3-0 and in the group. Plus 7 goal differential. Nobody had a chance. Nobody had a chance as the, uh, the MLS is back to it moves closer and closer to the knockout stage. The Blue Jays are gonna are expected to play their home games in Pittsburgh, which is interesting, and um, I'll be uh, curious to see how that how that works out. But it makes sense from a, a geographic perspective to get uh, some place in that region. I, I I don't understand why necessarily they had to go to a major league ballpark. I guess just because there's accommodations in those places already, rather than going to their AAA affiliate in Buffalo, but. It looks like Pittsburgh PNC Park will be the home of the Blue Jays and the Pirates uh, for the 2020 MLB season. And then, of course, per usual, touchline talking around the bases uh, tomorrow. MLS is back. It's getting close to the knockout stage, like I said. Baseball is back tomorrow, uh, and I'm sure Chris Brown will talk about, about that quite a bit on around the bases. Uh and, of course, a lot more on those shows. 11 a.m. Eastern, Touchline Talk with Josh Doring. 1 p.m. Eastern, Around the Bases with Chris Brown. Right here on the 110 Sports Network. 110sportsmedia.com slash live. I think that's all we have today. Thank you so much for making us a part of your day. 110sportsmedia.com. Check out the content over there. Follow me on Twitter at the TheJMole and, and 110 Sports on Twitter at 110 Sports. We'll do this again on Friday. We'll talk about the scrimmages. We'll talk about the return of Major League Baseball and so much more as we round up the week on Friday. But stay safe until then, and we'll see you 11 a.m. Eastern on Friday.